was walking to my co-workers and he was saying to them, you should go and have a baby because you are too big cost for our company. And the fourth woman said, my boss convinced me that after I had a baby, um, I went on um, a job which was for just half of the working time. Um, my boss said to me that my baby needs me. But at the end, I was at my workplace for eight hours, but I was paid half time less. And because of this, I had to work on different precarious projects. And then the other woman said, when I was 30 years old, something strange started to happen to me. I'm a precarious worker and I'm working on many different projects. And every single one of them started with the question, will you have a baby? Will you be able to work for us on this project? And um, the last story, after I came from the maternity leave, my boss forced me to start to work for six hours per day. I was already on my minimum wage, so I got a really small amount of money. I couldn't pay my bills. Because of this, I needed to start working on different projects during my weekend. I became a precarious worker with a real job. So, I'm a huge fan of those individual stories because I believe that those cases are really important because they are showing us what kind of concrete lives the individuals in the capitalism lives. They are showing us um, in which ways the system forced the women um, to feel bad about themselves, in which way the capitalism forced the women to leave the job, and in which way the capitalism forced the women to have a baby. So I believe that the women um, nowadays in Slovenia, after those interviews, are all the time uh, dealing with the double situation. In one way, um, the society is telling to them, be a mother, have a baby, the family is important. When you are 30 years old, there is a huge, uh, a huge um, belief in Slovenia that this is the right time to have a family. So um, those sayings from the families, from the bosses, from the friends are like a huge problem for the women. But on the other hand, immediately, immediately when uh, they decide to have a family, when they decide to um, have a baby, they become something else. They become a way to maximize the profit for their bosses. They become a way um, to make the money for the elite and they are like put out of the working process. So in, what, in, way, in which ways we can see this? So, Women are after the maternity leave, they don't get any projects. At the maternity leave, women who are precarious workers don't have enough money to pay the bills. They don't have enough money to take care of the babies. And because of that, they need to find other solutions. Some of them are also saying to us that they started to clean apartments um, on the black market because they couldn't afford to have those kids. Um, and um, on the other hand, when they come back to work, even if they have a regular job, there is a huge tendency from the society that they have to go back to their homes. But what does it mean? That means that they have to find new projects and that means that they, they are forced to be in precarious situations. And most of the women that we spoke with were because of this set. They were because of this really angry. They were because of this confused. But for me, what is the most important thing is that they thought that it's their fault. They believed that they don't have a job because they are not good enough. They believed that they don't have the money because they didn't try so hard. And they believed that the system is doing everything fine. They had an okay lifestyle before the moment they decided to have a baby. They were precarious workers with projects, they could travel and they could pay the bills. But after they had the baby, they lost all of this. So 
So what I believe is happening in this process is that the women internalize effects of the system in which we are living. Um, they are put away in the isolation and they start to deal with the problems of the everyday world with their own feelings and on their individual level. But what is also interesting in Slovenia, in the case of Slovenia, is that we don't talk about this. We don't talk about precarious women being pregnant. We don't talk about their difficulties um, in the period of maternity. Because we believe that our system is good. In Slovenia, we have a really strong um, tradition of socialism. We have a public school. We have a public health system. We have paid maternity leave for people with regular jobs, which lasts nine months. We also have the right to abort written in the Constitution. So if you just take a look at the laws and at the Constitution, we can say that Slovenia is a good country. But if you speak with the people, if you go and um, try to know their problems, you realize that there is a huge gap. That there is a huge gap between the laws and with the perception and with the troubles that people have. So, what is the problem is that the politics and the academia doesn't question the term of reproductive rights. We do not think what does the term reproductive rights means for the women in a precarious position. Um, there is like a common belief that women who are on the maternity leave have good lives that they get the money. And there is a huge silence and a huge taboo about the troubles that women have and about um, their problems. And because of that, women are afraid to speak. When we were doing those interviews, women didn't want to tell us that they are unhappy. They didn't want to tell us that they don't have the money to pay the bills because they believed that they are failing, not that the system is doing something wrong to them. So, what I think um, those stories show us, um, firstly, they show us that clearly in the capitalism, um, the um, relationship between the reproductive work and the productive work remains um, unaddressed. And this um, relationship with the reproductive work and the productive work is one of the conditions to provide the capitalism which is worse and worse and to make the inequalities between the people bigger and bigger. And what can we do? Um, I'm a huge fan of Simone de Beauvoir because I think that she was one of the first women that started um, to um, do the activism with their own personal stories. When she was in a battle for the um, right to abort, she gathered women all across the France and um, they made an announcement. They told to the people that they had an abortion and they told their own life story. And this was something that was really important and it was the beginning of the movement. When they told those stories, uh, the trade unions comes, the political parties comes, and the change was possible to manage. So what can we do as the left do? Um, I strongly believe that we need to find the people. We know the abstract concepts. We are having the same round tables every single year again and again. again. We know what is wrong in the capitalism. We know what are the main problems. So just stop talking. Stop organizing those round tables and start working with the real people. We need to come to the people and we need to give voice to the people. We may need to make them know that what are the real causes of their like, conditions. We, we have to make them sure um, that if they stand up for themselves, if they tell their stories, they will do something really important for all of us. But we need to support them with the political solution. solutions. Not small reforms, not quotas, I mean also quotas, but um, with the hope for a different society. We need to show them that it is possible 
to live in a society where that kind of problems doesn't exist. But we will make this when we will hear them. So give the voice to the people and I believe that then the change can happen. Structures of the dispositivity of the EU, 
So we would really have to discuss what we do. Do we do we make a revolution against the disproportionality, for example? What kind of what do you propose that we do? Because I think these economic structures are really inhibiting for liberation of women. It is really they are really inhibiting. They are really inhibiting our possibility to to to, to make a revolution. So I think uh, I would really wish that we could have more. Uh, of these kind of, of, of seminars and meetings where we can discuss together uh, what, uh, is, uh, what can we do, how can we help each other. I think it's very important for the country that we talk to. Thank you very much. As a researcher, as uh, uh, so someone uh, who's privileged with uh, education and uh, income and whatnot, how do you avoid uh, the uh, subject object relationship between you, the researcher, and uh, the women uh, you're uh, uh, recording without there being a, a repressive? The plasticity between you and the women, and the, the same would apply to you. How I always ask this question: It's so easy uh, to talk. Uh, uh, How do I do? I have to go closer. Oh, like this. Okay. Uh, what What do we do? Uh, we talk uh, in favor and for and uh, about, uh, but do we really uh, talk? With women, uh, with the plasticity, and that we uh, share our selves. They don't want us to just visit them, you see. It, it's over there. And 
Furthermore, we have this uh, female problem that they do not have the, the self-consciousness to say, okay, that's my right. So, in this moment, I suppose it could be a good idea to, um, to, to think about, because it's more for the moment you cannot do perhaps, uh, to think about a European-wide uh, um, uh, initiative to, to strengthen the care workers' struggles from this point here. I would propose. So, what do you think about that? <coughs> One more question. Yeah. <coughs> Buongiorno, eh, io sono Maria Nora e due questioni che si ricollegano in parte anche alla discussione diciamo, della prima parte della, della prima plenaria. E la prima mi interessava molto capire eh, il rapporto con le organizzazioni sindacali rispetto alle questioni che sono state sollevate, in particolare appunto la protezione delle lavoratrici eh, precarie in diritto alla maternità retribuita, perché abbiamo ascoltato che in Spagna c'è eh, il rapporto più fertile, efficace di collaborazione tra il movimento dei ministri e le associazioni sindacali. In Italia precisamente non abbiamo avuto la stessa fortuna perché diciamo, si esclude alcune sigle del, del sindacalismo di base, i sindacati maggiori che non hanno supportato la convocazione dello sciopero del Ministero del Comando e eh, appunto come, come veniva anche detto. La, la eh, questione che diciamo relativa a Francia cioè, è diciamo, qual è la situazione dei rapporti con i sindacati. La seconda questione che volevo porre riguarda invece la prospettiva politica perché a me sembra che eh, siamo in una fase in cui eh, i percorsi femministi sia da dell'elaborazione che dal punto di vista del movimento eh, riescono a eh, come dire, eh, avanzare una proposta quanto mai complessiva rispetto alla necessità di trasformazione sociale, eh, penso appunto al piano femminista italiano che prevede eh, la proposta del salario minimo europeo, del eh, reddito di autodeterminazione, quindi diciamo sia sul salario che sul reddito avanza proposte a livello europeo, penso alla riflessione di alcune eh, studiose e militanti che parlano eh, non solo di intersezionalità ma della necessità di essere eh, femministe per, essere, per lottare efficacemente contro il neoliberismo, della capacità del femminismo di reinterpretare complessivamente il tema della, eh, della lotta di classe. Volevo chiedere da questo punto di vista se diciamo, con le soggettività con cui siete in relazione eh, a che punto è questo tipo di e, diciamo, di riflessione sulla prospettiva intersezionale e sulla capacità del femminismo di avanzare in una eh, proposta complessiva sulla ricezione poi, di questa sfida, di questa possibilità da parte invece della sinistra partitica e della sinistra politica. Important what you said about the power of individual story. Um, this is also a very important tool that was used by a Polish pro abortion movement <coughs> to, um, to de de um, depolarize the topic of abortion in the society. So, uh, promote in, in the Okay, is it? 